This is J and P Talk Time. I'm P. And I'm Jay, and uh, today we are joined by our big sister, Ginny. She's a cardiac anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologist? It's all these medical terms that trip me up and make me feel dumb when I go <laughs> see the doctor. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, Dad said that if that's my career choice, he was going to have to figure out how to say it. I'm not sure he actually has mastered it yet, but he's trying. Okay, now something's off because I have in my notes here um, cardio jurassic surgeon mm. and <laughs> okay are you not are you not from the jurassic period i am not i've i have evolved since then timmy oh man she's not from the jurassic period <laughs> Oh, wow. He, he really messed these notes up. <laughs> um, I think you need to fire your intern, Philip. But um, you are a surgeon. Is that correct? No, I'm, I'm not. I assist in surgery, but I... <laughs> She's not even a surgeon! <laughs> Get in your cringe corner! <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm really embarrassed, Jenny. We're... Um, we're consummate professionals on this show, and that that was a big that was a big error. It's, um, apparently, they missed something in that in their research. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're going to try to win you back, but you know, <laughs> man. All right. So, could you give us um, just a brief summary of what it is that you do? What is a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist sure and maybe i'll just answer what an anesthesiologist is first and um okay and then we can dive down into the subspecialty topics but you know an anesthesiologist is the the physician who is an who's expert in the perioperative period and that's preparing patients for surgery um and assessing okay. the, if assessing their this risk is not like the jurassic period no this we've, is a different again, period we've still okay. evolved okay they didn't know what ether was back in the Jurassic period. Okay. Um, and uh, then in the operating room, um, uh, we're responsible for assisting with some form of um, either unconscious or, or analgesic state. So, um, so patients are either anesthetized or they can't feel pain um, during surgery. And there's a couple of ways that you can approach that. Um, and then afterwards, we're responsible for, well, and I would say interoperatively, we're also responsible for the resuscitation. So it's giving medications to raise or lower blood pressure. It's giving blood, giving fluids, et cetera, making sure that the hemodynamics, because, I mean, surgery is an insult to your body. So the hemodynamics um, have, have quite a bit of variability. Yeah, I can, you know, I went to a plastic surgeon for <laughs> examination. <laughs> And he insulted my body all over the place. Well, imagine if he had a knife in hand. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this wasn't even the surgery yet. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So with that said, we then take care of the post-operative period and, and help patients um, get their pain under control in the immediate post-op period of surgery and either get them optimized to go, to, um, go home or go to... Uh, a hospital room, um, a low care, uh, um, or into higher care, higher acuity care like the ICU. Okay, so, okay. So that's what an anesthesiologist does. And then as a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist, the specialization is in the specialized training is in t caring for patients that are undergoing surgery on their heart or lungs. So during those, those procedures, you need the lungs not to be moving, so breathing and and being very selective as to uh, which lung is actually breathing and, and isolating the surgical lung or in a heart procedure where you need the heart to be um, empty of blood and not moving, then then there's different um, ways that's approached. So that's the, the quick summary. You can isolate which lung stays active? That is true, yes. Wow. It's, it's, How do you do that? So there's what's yeah, called blockers. Do it, do it to Joey right now. You just you just get on top of him and you give him the old elbow. No, it has to do with where you put in the breathing tubes and which um, and then clamping and unclamping um, different 
different aspects of the breathing too. Wow. That's, that's very interesting. So it's sounding like uh, the anesthesiologist is kind of there for the assessment throughout the surgery. And then after the patient comes out, you kind of get sent away to different care. Normally, yes. We might have okay. some, some continuity of care if we've for providing some type of post op long term post operative pain, um, adjunct something like that. Okay. How much time do you usually spend with like each patient? You know, for for an anesthesiologist, it's variable. You could have a surgery that's fifteen minutes, and your whole encounter might end up being like a thirty minute type of. Mm -hmm. Or you could have, you know, like the case I was in the other day that was sixteen hours. So. So you're, you're present during the surgery? Someone from the anesthesia team is always present. Um, okay. I will say that we, we will delegate some of our um, care where we were the anesthesiologist may be more in the supervisory role. Because for example, I typically am covering um, two or more rooms at any given time and I'm the supervisor, but I have mm. individuals who've been highly trained who are either in their training process or are um, are uh, physician extenders such as nurse anesthetist or anesthesiology assistants who can sit there. And I won't say they can sit there, but who you know are are able to sort of do all of the all the care, and then I am called in for the high acuity and the high um, stressful situation. So at any any given given moment, you could have two or three people. Uh, undergoing surgery that you're kind of overseeing. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully they're better than Timmy because <laughs> if he was working there, it'd be a disaster. So much for your intern, Timmy. How do you all go about the process for determining surgery and who gets the, the final say in it? I, uh, that's a good question. So, Again, it's kind of a, it's a broad, but then a narrow topic in, in my subspecialty. So in, in a broad topic, for example, let's say that you need a knee replacement and you go, you've had pain, you go to your primary care doctor, your primary care doctor says, I think you should go to the orthopedic surgeon. You go to the orthopedic surgeon who then does some testing and says, yes, you have severe arthritis of your knee and you should have the joint replaced. Um, at that time, you know, there's there's certain risk factors. There's a known morbidity and mortality associated with that, um, and and depending on your comorbidities or the other diseases you have. So let's say you have lung trouble. Let's say you have heart trouble. Let's say you have kidney trouble. All of those are going to get, or all of those organs will be tested during surgery. So you'll either see, um, it may be that orthopedic surgeon says, I want you to see a cardiologist first, or I want you to see a certain doctor. They may say, go see the anesthesiologist. And then we look and say, okay, here are some areas that are unknowns that could be potential high risk for you. And we think you should go see your cardiologist and get heart testing. So, so that's, so, I mean, the surgeon says, I, I see a physical issue that can be corrected with surgery. Now we need to make sure that we're not going to miss something and the risk versus the benefits are worth it. So that, that's kind of the way it, it goes about. Cardiac surgery, you know, you're already going to already be seen by a cardiologist, or if it's a lung issue, you've probably been seen by, the, by a pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon. And then they look and say, okay, can we help? Can we physically do something um, to help with, with your issue? And then, um, you know, it's now, now risk versus benefits. So I don't know if that answers your question, Phil, but... Not really. It's it just seems like it's more of a conglomeration. It is. It's it's kind of a multi decision disciplinary um, approach. Now, there's lots of times like the day of surgery or during our pre op assessment, we may the surgeon says, Okay, you should come and have this surgery done. Um, maybe it's a vascular surgery case and we say, you know what, you uh you've had chest pain for the last three weeks and you need to go have a stress test. Um, or you need mm -hmm. to have your heart worked out or you need to have something like that. So those are the major reasons why we would potentially cancel a surgery or delay a surgery because if, if they're at high risk and we can possibly change something, then that's a decision that, that we want to be sure to offer to the patient. And then also you have to think about 
sometimes you're you're working on a timeline. Um, for example, cancer surgery, which is a lot of the lung surgery that we do. If someone's having, you know, if if it's possible that they would need like cardiac stents or something because of blocked coronaries. Um, you know, waiting the the six weeks after having those coronary stents placed might actually let their cancer progress so much that they would have a worse outcome. So. So is is that when the arteries are getting blocked? Correct. Gotcha. So you you said earlier about draining the blood from the heart. How do you do that? Yeah. So during heart surgery, your your heart is empty and stopped, and so you have to have a machine that keeps blood um, flowing throughout your body. So it's a pump. Um, mm -hmm. It's a pretty simple centrifugal pump um, that spins very fast and delivers a pressure um, throughout the arterial system. And then emptying the heart, um, it has to take the blood out, run it through the pump, and push it back. Uh, not only does it provide a pressure, so your organs are getting blood, but it also adds oxygen and takes out the um, CO2, the carbon dioxide. Okay. So we call it the heart-lung machine um, in simplistic terms. So do you just insert it like right where the aorta valve is? So it would be, it would be, traditionally it would be in the aorta. Okay. So it's on the, the distal side, on the other side of the aortic valve. And then mm -hmm. they put a clamp um, between where they've inserted the, the first cannula for the heart-lung machine, the arterial cannula. And then the aortic valve is there, and they can open the heart and access it. And then they go down into your vena system, like your inferior vena cava and your superior vena cava. And that's where they put in the cannulas that drain the blood into the machine. And then the blood takes out the CO2, adds the oxygen, and puts it back in the aorta. So is this done? You can't do this. This is done during surgery, right? Like yeah. You're already cutting the person open, and you got to get access. Yeah, you, you can technically do it from before you open the patient, if you um, use the vessels in your femoral, in your leg, your femoral artery, and your femoral vein. Mm. Okay. How do you feel about home surgeries, Jenny? <laughs> I've done a few myself, but- um, Really? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay. Office, small, maybe small office procedures, so. The, well, okay. There's an entire- Because I'm, I'm a, I'm wanting to give myself back surgery, <laughs> but I haven't completely worked it out. But I thought if I could hook a couple brooms together uh -huh. and then tape a knife on the end of it, yeah, then maybe I could go in and kind of you know decompress some of my disc. Mm. So it's not fully formed yet, but I'm coming up with a plan for it. Well, let me know when you have that plan worked out. Let me know how that goes. So maybe you could steal one of those like claw machines and add a add, add a scalpel to the claw, and just have them have, have them come down. The claw machines. Yeah, I those? I just would hire my new intern as Edward Scissorhands and. <laughs> yeah, maybe he could just do it with the scissors. Yeah, I don't know. He messes everything up though. That's true. So. You know, something like surgery, back surgery, it's not a big deal, but, you know, he, he'd mess it up. You know, I remember reading about this uh, Alaskan doctor who ended up performing surgery on himself for his, uh, taking out his appendix when he was getting ready to burst. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, actually, you probably could do that. I will tell you, um, when... When several anesthesiologists have had like GI bugs and just needed a bag of fluids to try to feel better, um, several have tried to insert their own IVs, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's quite challenging. You you may be able to get the IV inserted, but the problem is that you can't hold it still to connect the tubing to the little plastic cannula. Gotcha, because you're one-handed. So, yeah, <laughs> sitting there holding it. <laughs> Oh, that's that's like the hardest part if you're trying to give yourself your own IV. You can you can stick your own vein, you can get the little angiocath in the vessel, but connecting the tubing is yeah, very difficult. So sur 
surgery on yourself would be challenging. Sounds like you just need to pay a nurse 20 bucks. <laughs> Hey, come in here and just stick me real fast. Actually, you don't even need a nurse. You just need someone to connect the tubing for you. So what kind of, um, so you did your your general doctor training, I know, but what kind of training did you have to do in order to go into cardiothoracic anesthesiology? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So you do your four years of undergrad to get a, a bachelor's degree and then you do your four years of medical school and then anesthesiology is just for general anesthesiology is another four-year residency uh, in a residency you are getting you are drawing an income but it's it's a it's a small income um mm -hmm. and then for for cardiothoracic anesthesia it's another year fellowship that follows that so Five years total of anesthesiology training. Okay, and, and are those? Um, are you practicing? I mean, is that is that that's pretty intensive? Um, yeah, I mean, as a resident, you would be sitting the cases, so you would have an anesthesiologist who would be your um, who would be like the supervisor, but you're there doing the case from the beginning to the end. Same thing in fellowship. So how how crazy are the hours that you work? Um, I, I mean, it just depends. I, as far as just like the day, the the hours I'm in the OR, um, probably it's about fifty some per week. Mm -hmm. Um, the other hours that 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 go along with it are just because of my added roles, and the other roles that I play in my department. Gotcha. Did you did you work more during your residency? Uh, it was probably um, I actually work more now than I worked in my residency. Okay. So, yesterday, I was getting a glass of orange juice. Yes. So I got the orange juice out of the refrigerator and I poured it into the cup. I was holding the cup, and it shattered in my hand. Um, does this mean that the vaccine nanobots have finished assembling? <laughs> <laughs> Philip is now one of the new Marvel uh, superhero characters. Well, super super soldier is mm -hmm. the is the words that came to mind. Sh should I ask? Was this one of the glasses I purchased for you? No, no, no this was not. Oh, um, the vaccine nanobots. Yeah, sure, Mike. Yep. Your microchip was activated. Joe, Joe Biden was sitting there with a little button saying, we'll shatter glass. Boom. Mm -hmm. Superpowers okay. to Philip. Boom. I thought it was something like that, you know, but, you know, I know what delusions of grandeur are, <laughs> schizophrenics, and so I just wanted to confirm it. <laughs> oh, I, I understand that um, your region, the United States, is having some issues now with with the COVID variant. Yeah, it's. And here's the thing: it's always Northwest Arkansas. It's it's never so much Little Rock. Now we we did obviously have it as well, but I don't know what it is about Northwest. I mean, it's you've got the colleges and stuff up there, which which don't help much and. Yeah, it is a big area, but it's not that tightly packed. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I, I don't quite know. We just like look down on them for it, but they're probably not doing anything wrong. That's probably just the way it's going to be up there. What is the va is the, is the vaccination rate lower in that area? I don't know about in that area. Now in Arkansas, it's pretty low. In fact, my work has just now instituted a mandatory vaccination. Um, well, I heard that like three states were responsible for like 40% of the surge in cases and Missouri and Florida was on that list, but I don't think Arkansas was. You know, what was quite interesting was that as soon as we left um, our vacation in Branson, 
um, it was about a week afterwards that they were on the national no- news for Branson and Springfield for their. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Joey, did you bring the Delta virus with you? Oh, I brought a lot of things across <laughs> the border. <laughs> From your own country of California. Yeah. You know, it's funny because because California has like border checks. Like I've never seen it on any other state, but if you drive into the, into the state, there's like all the cars basically have to pull over and slow down and they just wave you through and that's all they do. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Interesting. I don't think I guess I've never driven across the border. I've driven in California quite a bit, but yeah. Leaving's just fine. It's also fi- funny if you go from California to Arizona, like right on the border, the gas is a dollar cheaper once mm-hmm. you get into Arizona. What about Nevada? Is there a significant decrease there? Um, For gas, I don't, I don't remember there being that sharp of a difference, but I could just be misremembering because I don't drive like you're only in, in Nevada for like thirty minutes, and you don't see that many gas stations. Okay. Now, Jenny, can you tell us um, what's your role in working with the fellows um, there at Cleveland Clinic? And right before that, I kind of have a little rant. Um, Please. The doctor's PR has got to get better. You guys have got to start start renaming things. <laughs> Um, if you own your own business, it's called a practice, which is a very old joke, but it's still a problem. (laughs) Then you have these other people working under you and you call them fellows, which I admit sounds better, but they're doing all the work. So they're not actually fellows. These are more like interns. So I feel like there needs to be a significant rebranding here in the United States of doctor names. Maybe something more cheerful. I haven't come up with any. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it is ironic that we name our our formal business as a practice as if, you know, we're still learning. And uh, and I guess that is a reality. You learn something new every day. And after 10 years of doing this, I still learn something new. Um, yeah, and fellows, I was, I thought you were going to go down the rant of, you know, you have, um, fellows is traditionally considered a a male term and you have female and male fellows and, you know, why do you keep calling the girls fellows? Um, oh yeah, I'm not worried about that. (laughs) You're not worried. Okay. You're that That's acceptable to you. Um, yeah. Well, I, I would say that, I mean, there is some delineation. Uh, intern is traditionally your very first year. And we say as an intern, the only one who thinks you're a doctor is your mom. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, you're the intern, uh-huh. Or like, okay, all right, what's your name? All right. Okay, Jed, here you go, you know. <laughs> and, and you'll you'll laugh because you'll... um. You'll be out at a restaurant and someone will be stupid enough to put on their name, like on their reservation, like, you know, Dr. Smith. And I'm always laughing. I'm like, you know, that has to be an intern. Because I'll be like, the table's, Dr. Smith, your table is ready. I'm like, has to be an intern. No one who's been out practicing long enough, who's seen, who's had enough experience, who doesn't have a personality disorder, wants Mm -hmm. anyone else to know that they're a doctor. (laughs) <laughs> um, because, you know, they expect the tips to be higher. They expect, um, they expect everything else. And, and you just know people are just going to ask you very unusual things. You know, hey, you want to take a look at my toenail? It's been bothering my, your waiter will be like, hey, you want to look at my toenail? It's been bothering me all week. You know, so anyhow, so, so intern is traditionally your first year, although they've tried to eliminate that. And it's, it has to do with the way the education st- system is now set up. It used to be everyone did an internship and then you went into a residency and then they just started integrating that. So now you enter a residency and it's your first year of residency, but you've already picked your specialty. So you don't have as much as just the general year where you really learn how to become a doctor. Um, and then fellow is, is to sort of, you know, just recognize that people are, are um, 
past that they're board eligible to be a general specialist. So like an anesthesiologist who's, who's doing a fellowship, critical care, pain medicine, whatever, they could go out and be board certified and be a practicing staff anesthesiologist, but they've decided they want an, an extra year of training. So we had to come up with a new name for that. Mm -hmm. So we're behind the times. We, uh, what can I say? We have our own, there, there's many strange things, old traditions that go back to the guilds um, in medicine that, that. It, it keeps industries alive that would have long, just out in the general population, would have been obsolete a long time ago. Yeah, because, you know, I also have a problem with, uh, I can't remember the name, the medical symbol. Because it has two, two snakes on it. <laughs> oh. Yes. And man, just, yeah, I, I think you can treat certain things with snake venom, can't you? But life, I, I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think that that's a great a great symbol for you all. I think it should be two pandas. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would um, really help change the perception of doctors. Everyone would, would be excited. Yeah. To go to the doctor. They'd be like, let's go see the pandas. <laughs> yeah. The caducus was the, the medical symbol. And you know what it actually came from was the. Um, Tapeworms. This is oh, fascinating. Very, very nice. And They're actually how they tapeworms. Used to wind the tapeworms out. <laughs> that was the thought in medieval times. If I remember correctly, I'm having to go back to. Yeah. And you guys kept this symbol around, huh? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> oh. Now, speaking of um, people who like like to add titles on their name, like mm -hmm. making a reservation as a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, what's funny is the Navy air crew, so the people who actually um, fly the planes or have flown the planes, they all have their own un unique call signs. Oh, yeah. And they will politely, you know, insist that you call them by their call sign. What have been some of the most interesting call signs you've encountered, Joe? I've only really encountered one, but there, I, I think some are quite provocative. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm sure you know if there's an innuendo in it, then it isn't worthwhile using if, if yeah, you're in the military. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they have those. I just thought it was funny, um, culture shock for when I came out, started working on a base, I guess. So, Jenny, can you tell us about the work that you do with um, with the fellows oh, yeah. at Cleveland Clinic? You guys distracted me talking about the... Uh, the tape the, tapeworms the, and pandas. Yeah, the ancient pr practices of, of medicine that still um, are, are around today. Um, yeah, so uh, a, a fellowship is a, a one-year training program, and, and there are about 70... It's just under 75 fellowships in the United States about 210 people every year I'm um, trained in the subspecialty of cardiothoracic anesthesia and we have the largest program being a very um, robust cardiac center um, here in Cleveland so we have 18 fellows and so I um, I have the the opportunity and and to work with 16 which will now be starting into 18 um, new people every year and bringing them in from all over the United States and Canada um, to come and spend a year with us and really perfect their skill when it comes to caring for cardiothoracic surgical patients. So, so that's what I do. Uh, it was it was kind of interesting. Apparently, in my last orientation, I, I made the comment to them, um, "I am not your mother," and so I, I'm not going to. <laughs> I said my program coordinator may be your mother, but I'm not your mother. I'm not here to make sure you get all of your work done. So. Their graduation present to me last week was two things. Number one, it was a KC Chiefs jersey that says, number one, it says Hargrave on the back of it. Nice. Uh -huh. And then the second was a book, was the, the Dr. Um, Seuss book, uh, Are You My Mother? In which they had all posted <laughs> pictures of themselves at each of the little little uh, the little birds um, pages uh, through throughout the book. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was well thought out. 
So this wasn't one of the Dr. Seuss books that got canceled, right? No, it apparently is still it is still cultural appropriate. Okay, good. So you talked about uh, bringing the fellows in. Do you go and recruit certain fellows? They they come to us most likely. They come in okay. through an interview process. And this year was very interesting because for the first time only, it was one hundred percent virtual, and that was a mandate. Hmm. Uh -huh. And I'll just say that um, I think it, I, I, I told them, I mean, I feel sorry because I, I can't imagine trying to choose where you were going to sign up to work for a year um, just doing an interview over the phone or over, over Zoom. I mean, it's really, it's hard to get a feel. You can meet people. Um, it, I think probably our best recruiting strategy was to have someone that they knew who was already there. That they could reach out to because you just i mean you could make anything look really good for a few hours mm -hmm. and so um yeah so they they tend to come and check out our institution they check out our program they talk to our fellows and our faculty and then there's a, a selection process that um we rank and they rank and it goes into a goes into a magic little bowl and shakes up and we see um which what falls out at the end <laughs> I just had like a mm. mental image of you had like that big bingo ball with all the <laughs> names in it. And you're just pulling names sort out. Sort of like that. They uh, apparently, you know, jo with Joey being a programmer, he knows how to, you know, do these matching um, pros uh, algorithms. But yeah. And so, what's what kind of day to day things are you doing to work with the fellows? Um, I know you said you're not their mother, and so they've got to go get their work done. But um, what what part are you are you managing? So on the day to day, it would be the, the clinical interaction. So you know we come together, um, form a plan. At that time, I sort of start assessing where they are in their knowledge base um, and their understanding of patient management. Then we would begin to start the case, and I would be helping them through various aspects as far as whether it be technical troubleshooting of, of some of the technical procedures that we would be doing. And then um, throughout it, you know, typically we have a topic or two during the day that when we um, maybe are on the heart-lung machine that we can talk about. And, um, you know, just pointing out to them, did you recognize, do you see what's happening here? Do you recognize this? Uh, what are your thoughts here? How would you like to manage this? So oversight, but yet it's an educational oversight. And then on the side, I do a, a significant number of didactical lectures where we sit down and, and have a formal didactical session over topics. And then as a program director, there's, there's a significant amount of paperwork just for the program to maintain our accreditation um, with the accreditation. And, um, and then there's quite a bit of paperwork just for the fellows themselves. As they start to get jobs, they need all their all this paperwork filled out for their new jobs, and and then um, probably the only other thing that I can really think of is designing and arranging for the curriculum. So if I know we're going to have X number of of topical discussions, and I'm reaching out to faculty and trying to get them to see which dates are available, and you know would they be willing, and and so. Um, right now, I'm I'm revamping the entire curriculum for the upcoming year, and so um, yeah, that's the big, big push right now. And, and it, everyone's schedules change, but it becomes hard when you when you try to lock things in, and then everyone's changing their schedule. So. So when you're managing a group of people, Jenny, the first thing you have to do is make them fear you. Yes, establish domin <laughs> dominance. Correct. <laughs> So you need to just, at the beginning, have them all at a table and ask them a question. Before anyone can answer, no, you asked a certain person a question. Before he can answer, say, wrong, next. <laughs> That's how you win them over. Oh. And then the next person tries. You go, wrong, next. You go, not you, him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a very successful strategy I've used in... um not managing people but in my head <laughs> i've i've been very successful with that also if you want to win arguments after everything they say <laughs> just say in theory yeah it works <laughs> these are all methods that you use on social media jenny 
And um, we found that they're quite effective in real life as well. It's interesting. And you know what's unique is that, number one, you bring in 16, 18 people who were the cream of the crop where they came from. They were the chiefs. They were the they were the ones, the high performers in their group. And then you throw them into a group of other high performers from all over. And it's really hard for them to, to know. They're like, wait, wait, wait. I, I mean, I'm not the top of the, or wow, this person is as good as I am. Or, you know, and so it's, it really is some, a bit of a transition for everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is a unique component of it. And then even, even more than that, um, it um it's everyone's different like the way you teach one person like one person you have to you know when they when they are when they do not perform well you know they respond best to that tough you're do, you're failing you're not doing right this you you need to pick it up you need to you know you miss this patient would have died if i hadn't been there to catch this etc um you have that person who that's the way you have to approach it and it gets through to them. And then you have the other person where you have to just really, you have to approach it a totally different way saying, you know, here are the areas. It, it, it's a totally different way you approach each person. And it, it makes it a very interesting aspect to teaching. The one thing that I, I think about is like how scary it must be to get in the medical field because you have like so much responsibility i mean like pe people are in your hands at that point if you mess up they could die yeah I, you're not incorrect with that and i don't want to over dramatize it but i think we become so used to it um i think sometimes when you're debriefing yourself walking out to your car and you realize how close it came that day um mm -hmm. It hits you more then than than in the moment but um it is a very yeah i mean it is and i mean some things are not as acute but i think a lot of physicians take their work mentally home with them so you're the the general practitioner you saw someone you didn't think when you saw them initially that it was anything to worry about and you've gone home now now it's saturday night and you're sitting back there thinking wow did i miss something you know i want you know maybe it's an aortic dissection and i just thought it was a was a little bit of uh, acid reflux, and I, I think that can get in the head of many doctors. So, what's your advice on like handling that kind of stuff, Jenny? I think you have to trust your intuition, and and realize, and, and don't don't take it out. I mean, don't take it with you if you can. Um, and I think that's hard, but I think you have to say, you know, in that moment. I thought this is what my read was on it. And I think I need to stick with that because when you, when you can see it from 2020 vision, it's easier to, to question. So I right. just say, you have to trust your intuition at the moment. You probably build up some confidence after you've been in it for a while and you build up your knowledge base too. And you've just seen it. You've seen it before and you know, you're going to see it again. So mm -hmm. it does. Certainly, yeah, yeah. I don't think, I think especially for young, for, for newly trained, newly um, established physicians, I think they struggle for at least the first two to three years with bringing their work home and and just fixating on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe that's what makes good doctors. It probably does make good doctors, and I would say those are the ones that care. The ones, I guess, the ones that concern me a little bit more are the ones who are kind of, it's five o'clock and I'm done type of attitude. Mm -hmm. The disconnect. Yeah, do any of the fellows you work with, do they ever end up taking positions at Cleveland Clinic? They're only about one per year. These are all uh, U.S. and Canada-based fellows, or do you get any like international? Yeah, so the requirement is that, it, that you have to be under an ACGME program. That's the accreditation body, and so uh, most international training programs do not establish that unless you've come and done an additional training program in the United States, and that's quite frequent. That that's seen very frequently. 
So individuals who have gone to medical school, and it's if you've gone to medical school in another country, it is challenging to find a residency position in the United States. It does happen, but it, I would say it's a very low percentage success. Mm. And then um, if even if you have completed your your re completed a residency in another country, the United States, with the exception of Canada, and maybe a few other countries, there are some. There are a couple of, of, of institutions um, outside the U.S. and Canada that we would accept as being comparable to U.S. training. But, you know, you, you may have trained in a very, in a facility with limited resources and you just don't have the skill set to integrate into the United States system um, without having some training. So almost everyone will have to come here and complete a United States residency. You have to you have to keep up with like a lot of cert certifications and training, too. Like just, mm -hmm. is it like on an annual basis? Yeah, uh, states to renew your. Typically, you have not only what's required of your specialty certification, but there's also each state has a different requirement, um, which is quite interesting. And I, I it it's not it it's I guess it's a good thing. Um, some uh, certain states have different needs. So if I am practicing in California, I'm probably seeing some diseases and maybe situations that I wouldn't see in Ohio. So if I am licensed in California, I need to keep up with what what the issues are in that state. So um, yeah, but it's in some ways it seems a little bit ridiculous that one state has this, another state has that, and for your mm -hmm. license. And most of us are licensed in a majority in many in several different states. Um, we have to we have to kind of keep up with um, what your specific state requires, and then you have all of your whatever you're certified in: radiology, pathology, anesthesiology. And then if you're subspecialty certified, like I'm sub I'm certified in echo, whatever their requirements are. So I I'm saying it's all um, there's a lot of financial aspects that go into it that um cause some general frustrations among physicians how much time do you think it takes to get your certifications done as far as like the number of years or like i'm assuming it's done on a annual basis it's it's it historically had been on a 10-year basis okay um, some people have been got grandfathered in and given lifetime certification. Um, probably those were individuals who trained in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So they are not required to necessarily continuously certify. Um, it's changed a little bit. So it's not really truly a 10 years. It's more on a... It's not like you have to sit down and take the test again every 10 years. It's more of a three-year continuing cycle that has a little bit of testing and a lot of learning um, in those different periods. So, Can you tell us about the College of Anesthesiologists? Um, what is that? Why did you all choose to go back to college again? <laughs> the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists, AOCA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so so that was the prof that is the professional home for osteopathic for for DO um, and and just to clarify in the United States there are two forms of medical school. Um, there's the MD, the more which is probably the more recognized medical doctor, and um, then there's the doctor of osteopathy or osteopathic medicine, which would be DO, and um, the history behind that was that. Medicine in America in the 1800s was quite primitive. I mean, it was leeches. It was, mm. um, you know, just there was just not a lot of answers. And so an MD um, by the name of... Man, I've, I, I've got to get a new doctor then. <laughs> Andrew Taylor Still. <laughs> um, he, uh, in living in Kirksville, Missouri, he said, I think we can do something better. And he started doing a, a lot of work with anatomy um, and trying to understand the human body. And it, it really, you know, I mean, as I said, medicine was, was quite primitive. And that was during, um, during the times they were seeing actually a lot of pandemics, very similar to what we're seeing in COVID, um, and, and seeing just large portions, a fair portion of the, po of 
of the population passing away with flu and et cetera. So that's, that's where the, the medical schools, um, DO that are in the United States, they, they all sort of formed out of that work. So the American College of, or the American Osteopathic College of Anesthesiologists, they are um, sort of, they're, they're all involved in that network, and we try to recognize and support um, DOs who are in the anesthesiology field. So I've been, I've been involved in that organization now for about 12 years. I am the vice president, um, will be the president-elect in December, in September. And so we really work hard to provide great networking and, and education um, for anesthesiologists. I didn't even know, like, the election had been coming up, Jenny. I would have voted for you, <laughs> but I... I think I think I, I should have. I guess I forgot about it. I think I should have stacked the deck right and tried to um, tried to provide uh, tried to get my family and to be able to vote for me. Could have added you guys as members. <laughs> so, and you talked about some of the primitive um, medical method methods. Mm -hmm. Are you um, pro or nay bleeding? Well, I don't think we have much evidence that it worked, and so. Um, yeah, hopefully we've moved on past those days. Oh man, I got to get a new doctor. <laughs> I believe that, um, in the college, you all put on a lot of different seminars. Mm -hmm. Um, how do those go about? How do you all decide what kind of seminar you're going to put on and what you're going to discuss? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, it depends. I mean, some of it is asking members what they feel like their their gaps are and then trying to fill those gaps. And then it comes from kind of looking and recruiting what, what are the hot topics, what's been at other seminars, what's been published lately, and how can we how can we reach out to those individuals? So um, we're actually very excited. We are having, for our September seminar, we're having um, Jerome Adams, who was the first anesthesiologist to be a surgeon general. And... Mm -hmm. um, J, J. Adams, uh -huh. J. Adams, yep. yeah. Jerome Adams, yes, J. J. Adams. J. was a bit earlier than than that, but um, <laughs> and I think he was a lawyer and not a Surgeon General. Which reminds me, Phil, this is a bit of a this is another tangent, but oh uh, yeah, that's okay. Sometimes okay. we should go in the steps of we should go back and follow the steps of Hargrave history, um, and uh, go back and and do a at least a, a few sibling uh, trip to Virginia. Um, and is that where the, uh, the bad Linson Bart was? <laughs> no, that was, that was where the Hargrave came over. Hmm. 1620 huh. Jamestown. Hmm. So you can find it. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. I, I wasn't able to find a lot about specifically, and by the way, the name is was Richard Hargrave. Richard has been a family <laughs> name for a long time. Oh. Um, and you see it throughout our family tree that Richard has been a very popular name. I wonder if those Hargraves were as crazy as we are. <laughs> or if maybe, because it, it seems like, well, they kind of got things together. They came over. I don't know. They might have been better functioning than the the current Hargrave family. Well, what I couldn't figure out, and I was trying to to research when I was in um, Jamestown and Richmond and, and those a, a couple of years ago, I was trying to find um, the records to see if Richard Hargrave actually came over as not an indentured servant, but like he owed. Uh, uh, what happened was that if people owed money, lots of times. Um, the debt, the, the the debt owner would send the debtor across the United States and say, "Go out and make some money for me, establish an estate, and I'll you can pay me back that way." Mm -hmm. Versus kind of going out as an ex as an explorer. So, but um mm -hmm. the 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 Jamestown, the Williamsburg, the Yorktown area, um, all of that is quite fascinating. So where were we at before Virginia? Suffolk. Hmm. There's a, a Lord Hargrove. And actually there's a town in England called Hargrave. 
Really? That was his estate. So yes. we ran that town. We did. Nice. We were aristoc. Oh, no. We were aristocracy in England at one point in time. Oh no. Well, I'm sure there's a horrible story about how we lost that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody probably bet it all in black. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> And I've got to figure this out because I was on, I, I had an email yesterday from my Ancestry.com account. And they're like, hey, you have a first cousin by DNA. <laughs> hmm. Like, I have <laughs> no idea who this person is. Never heard. <laughs> is, he, is he in the U.S.? Yes. Did they give you his home address? And... No. A lot of, <laughs> several of them are related to mom because mom's family is pretty active on that. So. But most of those names I can recognize as being a cousin of mom's. But this one, I I don't know. I think it comes from Grandma Hargrave's side somewhere. Hmm. So I'm picturing Lord Hargrave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like on his horse and he just keeps knocking down people <laughs> in, in this town. And just he won't stop. And they're like, look, you seriously, you, you got to stop this. And he finally he goes, okay, well, I better have an escape plan because I'm not going to stop knocking people down on, on my horse. And so he sends a Hargrave over to make an establishment here in the United States so he can escape when the people have had enough. Anyway, I feel like that probably should go directly into um, a book or something. Yeah, I'm liking this origin, family tree. origin story. Yeah, yeah. We also apparently are related to a castle owner in Scotland. Um, oh, shoot. Yeah, what happened to <laughs> us? Well, we came to the new country in search of something and uh, seem to have lost out. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, have a little family reunion in uh, Scotland. <laughs> Maybe so. Take back the castle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We just get all our all the Hargraves together and lay siege. There we go. <laughs> now, Jenny, mm-hmm. um, what's your favorite conspiracy theory? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Do I have to have a favorite? Can't I just like them all? Uh, we prefer a favorite. Now, you don't have to confirm that you believe it or anything. Um, you can if you want to. But that may not go down well with the fellows. <laughs> what has been your conspiracy theory of the of the month, Phil, that you've enjoyed? So the one I'm stuck on is Bigfoot in Arkansas. Okay. Because somehow Bigfoot cloaks himself. Mm-hmm. And that's why you can't ever get um, good pictures or videos of him. That makes sense. Because he has some kind of organic or technological cloaking device. Mm. And so that's why all the the photos are real blurry and they just kind of look like shadows. And so, you know, people can hear him all the time. Like there's a lot of loud noises. But, um, you know, you just can't see him with that cloaking cloaking device, whatever it is. So anyway, I've been spending a lot of time on that on Facebook. Bill, my uh, my coworker was telling me about an, an encounter where, like, basically, family bought a cabin out in the sticks, and they the son apparently the father found the son like talking to Bigfoot through a window, and he was like chittering at him or something like that. So the father shot it, shot at him. Bigfoot didn't like that, so he messed up the cabin. They had to leave. <laughs> so Bigfoot is also in California. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was based in California. It might have been like Mississippi or something like that. Like he's he tells me so many crazy things that they stop kind of like staying in my brain after a while. And mm-hmm. it all just kind of blurs together. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Well, I think I'd have to go with something about a vaccination a conspiracy, probably that there's a microchip chip in the vaccine. Bill Gates nanobots. Yes. Do it for Bill, guys. Bill really wants you to get this vaccine. (laughs) 
All right. Is there anything else you want to say about your job, Jenny, or what you do? Um, not, not that I know off the top of my mind. I, I really enjoy what I do. It's um very high intensity. There's a lot of very, I mean, patients are, are certainly um, oftentimes kind of a last resort when we see them. Um, it's they're very debilitated mm. and um it's it's a hope that we the work that we're doing to help care for them can can help lead them to a better life um after recovery so so that's that's a great rewarding thing and then i, I really love the opportunity to teach and work with other people so that provides me with a lot of self um satisfaction and i think having an impact is really one of the key things and when, when I kind of, when, when I'll be asked, you know, what provides you with satisfaction and people tease out when I start talking about it, it comes back, you know, are you able to have an impact, um, whether it be with your patients or with your trainees? Um, it, it's not about the money. It's not about the title. It's not about any of those things, but it's, do you feel like you've, you've been able to impact something? So that's sort of my takeaway from my work. Very cool. So you don't you don't put doctor on your restaurant reservations? I, I do not. Okay. All right. Nor do I have I'll... it on my driver's license. That's another <laughs> big one. I mean, can you just say please sue me? You should put it on your mailbox too yeah, at that yeah. point. <laughs> oh man. All right, Joey, did you have anything else? I don't think so, man. Life's a garden. Dig it. All right, Jenny, thanks for coming on with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Talk time over, Joey. Talk time's over.